Good evening. Welcome to Inside Out. I'm Pat Smith, and this is where we take you inside state, local, and federal government to bring information out to you. Helping me do that tonight to illuminate what's going on in our circuit court are Judge Kevin Hessler and Judge Jill Cummins. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good. First matter of concern is you guys are actually on a ballot coming up in June 24th. June 26th. And early voting. June 26th. June 26th. And uh, on early voting that starts today or tomorrow. Thursday. Is that tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow. June 14th yeah. to the 21st for early voting. Early voting, right. And you go through such an extensive process of vetting and all to, to uh, become appointed a judge in the circuit court. Uh, and it's having an election that's called a retention election. You know, people are voting to retain you, not elect you. Uh, to the position really seems totally unnecessary. And I don't want you, I know I'm not putting you in a corner that you have to comment on that because uh, I'm sure you feel likewise. Kevin, would you describe to our viewers what you go through to get to the appointment stage? Well, it's been variously described as arduous and grueling. Uh, I think those are both accurate in my experience, but probably for a good reason. Uh, you want to make sure that your judges are qualified. Uh, and uh, are selected from among uh, the best of all of the applicants. Um, so the uh, process involves, it begins with uh, deciding to do it, uh, which is a big <laughs> deal, and then uh, you are uh, required to fill out a very thorough application that asks about every aspect of your career and your life before you were a lawyer. Uh, then they ask for writing samples. Uh, that gets circulated to, uh, I think it was like 14 different specialty bar associations. They all have a uh, review, the opportunity to review it and interview you if they like. And uh, I think most of us went through uh, 13 or 14 different interviews mm -hmm. with different groups, sometimes two a night. You'd travel all over to uh, go to them. And then uh, those uh, bar associations would weigh in on whether they felt you were qualified, uh, highly qualified, recommended. All of that information is assembled uh, by uh, an, a, a, a group called the Trial Court Judicial Nominating Commission. They conduct an interview. Uh, they review your application and all the input, the background, and they make a recommendation about whether uh, you should be included on uh, a small list, generally, that would go to the governor for consideration. Um, and uh, from those people, the governor picks, uh, and uh, that's what we had to go through. Uh, but by the time it gets to the end of the process, you've been looked at up and down. Uh, and uh, the other thing that, that happens is they talk not just to the people you list as references, but to the people that You've tried cases against people that weren't listed on your application, so they really get a good viewpoint uh, of all aspects of you. Uh, and the specialty <coughs> bars, it takes into consideration all of the special interests in our community. Right. You know, that takes in all of the uh, nationality, but the uh, born, which is African-American lawyers, and, you know, the Hispanic bar and all the way down the line, the Absolutely. Pacific Asian bar, etc. So everybody really gets to have some input and a chance to grill you uh, as well. And, and, and that's a good thing, I think. Yeah. Because you want a good cross-section of the community to have uh, the opportunity to weigh in on who they think is qualified. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a lot of time, there's an overlap between a lot of the specialty bar associations, but mm -hmm. each of them represent their own group or constituency, uh, while a lot of us belong to more than one of the different bar, specialty bar associations. It's important that each one has a seat at the table and gets to weigh in on who will be appointed to the bench and, and their qualifications and how they will represent or or how they will be on the bench when their constituency appears before them. Mm -hmm. So you've got the Women's Bar Association, you've got the Hispanic Bar Association, you've got the Asian Pacific Bar Association, you've got the LGBT Bar Association, the J. Franklin Bourne, which you mentioned is the African American Bar Association, the Simon Soboloff Bar Association, which is uh, the Jewish Bar Association, the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys, 
uh, the Monumental Bar Association, the Women's Law Center, the Maryland Defense Council, the Maryland State Bar Association, and the Montgomery County Bar Association. So and all the of those Criminal groups. Defense Attorneys Association. <laughs> right. And Maryland Association for Justice. So right. everybody has a seat at the table and gets to weigh in. Now, obviously, there is overlap between these bar associations and their interests, but each of them has their own constituency and issues with which they are concerned about to ensure that whoever is appointed to the bench is going to be able to adequately and appropriately uh, weigh in or decide matters regarding mm -hmm. their constituency. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's what's important, that we've gone through this process and have been, <clears throat> as Judge Hessler said, reviewed by each of these organizations up and down, I want to say sometimes poked and prodded, that they, they know everything. Mm -hmm. They've had an opportunity to look behind the curtain to see what goes on with each of us. So, And I think it's important for our viewers to know that these associations mm -hmm. are not just local Montgomery County Bar Associations. They're no. statewide in the state of Maryland. So yes. You mentioned the Monument Bar, that's <laughs> up there in Baltimore City. Uh, and the other ethnic bars, of course, are, are And the Women's Bar and yeah. the uh, Women's Law Center, they're statewide. Exactly. So. And the right. Maryland State Bar Association right. for all the attorneys in the state of Maryland. Way in on it. So then they all make their recommendations to the governor's Judicial Nominating Commission? Correct. All right. And that's a pretty imposing interview, I will tell you. There's 17 people sitting around that table, and you're on one side, and they're all uh, able In to. The and, they, shape, right, yeah. and they have all the input about you, and they ask some tough questions. Mm -hmm. And then they come up with a short list that gets sent down to Annapolis to the government. Right. And if you're on that list, you're on it for two years. You can be Mm -hmm. selected by whoever happens to be the governor at a particular time when a judicial vacancy comes up. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't stop the vetting because the governor has a staff that is specifically assigned Correct. Absolutely. to re-vetting everybody that comes in on the short list. Right. Absolutely. It's really quite a process. It is. It I is. think another thing... But I will say it's worth it. It's a good, great job. Great job. You're yeah. enjoying it. I, I look forward to coming in uh, every day. It's it, requires a lot. There's a lot to it. Uh, you just, you can hear a wide variety of cases. Um, you have to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Everybody has, uh, the other sitting judges that uh, are on the ballot to be retained have also expressed exactly the same. They just absolutely love the it's job. It's a great love job. Getting in to go, go to work in the morning. That's wonderful. I think one of the things our viewers have to understand I want to get into is what your individual experience is in the courthouse, in trying cases, both bench trials before a judge and before juries. Judge Cummins, your litigation experience very extensive. Uh, right, I have come from an extensive litigation background, and it was primarily complex civil litigation for the last for 29 years. Mm -hmm. I did do some family and uh, criminal work early in my career, but I would say the majority was on complex civil litigation. I had the opportunity to try cases all across the state, uh, in counties all across the state, mm -hmm. federal uh, courts, state courts, as well as in the District of Columbia. And that came in, comes in very handy sitting on the bench now in the circuit court where we hear jury trials, we hear bench trials every single day. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, your, your background and your experience is, uh, is important in this job and being able to take complex matters and some of the areas that we practice in that appear before us now were areas that we didn't have in our in our previous in our legal career in our practice areas so it's good to be able to pick up the phone call my colleagues judge Hessler was an expert in uh, all things family law matters mm -hmm. so I can pick up the phone and call him uh, you know walk up to his chambers and talk to him about a case and uh, my thoughts and and He's very generous with his time mm -hmm. and will share information. So that, that's very important, too, for all of us. But we have to be able to take a good deal of information and synthesize it, process it, interpret mm -hmm. the law on it, and apply the law in all areas of the law in a very short period of time. Well, I remember when Judge Hessler here first started to practice after he was clerking, and, and you went to work with the three of the icons of uh, Montgomery County lawyers, uh, Bill Miller, Jim Miller, and Harvey Steinberg. 
uh, who we used to call Harvey Wallbake, because he liked that <laughs> drink or whatever it was. But uh, you really grew up uh, in the practice of law with the best of the trial practice. I mean, no one beat Jim Miller at criminal defense work, and very few people uh, were happy to have Harvey Steinberg on the other side of a divorce case. Well, I, I was privileged to be with them for 16 years, the first 16 years of my practice uh, as a litigator, <clears throat> primarily in the circuit court for Montgomery County, which is where I now sit as a judge. Um, and during the time I was with them, I had uh, the opportunity to be involved in a broad range of both civil and criminal cases, mm -hmm. um, and because that's the kind of uh, practice they had. <clears throat> Um, and then after that, I had uh, an equal privilege to be involved with another firm, uh, Draga, Hannon, Hessler, and Wills, uh, which has uh, provided me with the opportunity to really excel at uh, the area of family law because that was my primary focus. We handled um, a lot of complex um, financial cases, uh, cases with complex financial aspects but also highly contested custody cases. And that's important for me now because over 50% of the civil case filings in mm -hmm. Montgomery County Circuit Court are family law cases. So having some good knowledge of that. But you're right, working with those good lawyers in both of those firms has really helped me. I've always been a strong uh, believer in uh, mentorship uh, and mentoring uh, of lawyers uh, as they come along makes them mm -hmm. better lawyers. Aside from giving them the experience uh, to try cases, which I did for a total of 34 years before I became a, uh, a judge. Uh, but uh, mentoring guides you, teaches you how to do things and how not to do things. And um, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of lawyers that don't have that opportunity, but I was really fortunate to have had it. Mm -hmm. Very good situation. And so going to the circuit court as a judge now, you join one of your former colleagues at Dragger Firm. Right, and Cindy Callahan, Judge said, Cindy Callahan. Cindy Callahan. Uh, who's and, tremendous. And she primarily uh, is in charge of the uh, family, family, family law division. building. Right. It's a, a separate tower among the two towers, right. basically. Right. And in that family law uh, division right below it, uh, and a part of it, is juvenile law. Have you had a chance to be in the juvenile swing yet? I have not. As of now, I'm in the civil <coughs> rotation, which mm -hmm. is good since that was primarily my background. I'm in the civil rotation right now. In January, our rotations are 18 months. In January, I will rotate into the criminal uh, rotation. So mm -hmm. I have not had an opportunity to sit in the juvenile area yet. Mm -hmm. Some of that, uh, Judge Hessler, are you can familiar with the sinner and sins type of uh, cases that right. I'm, children I'm gonna in be... need of service and in need of assistance. Right. I currently <clears throat> I started off in general uh, general civil rotation, hearing all different kinds of cases. Uh, in January, I rotated into uh, the family division, but I still get a fair number of non-family cases to hear and try. Uh, next January, I'll be uh, rotating into uh, Senate, Child in Need of Assistance rotation, and hear those cases. That'll be great. A lot to learn. <clears throat> yeah, they're tough learn. cases. They really are. It's time for us to take a short break. I'm Pat Smith. This is Inside Out. We'll be right back. We, we just, just finished, finished dinner, dinner, and it was time, time for homework. He I hates hate homework. homework. I know he's bright. Why is it so hard for me? He's I'm just trying as try hard as I harder. can. One in five children struggle with learning and attention issues. Go from misunderstanding to understood.org. Welcome back. You're watching Inside Out. I'm Pat Smith. This is where we take you inside state, local, and federal government and bring that information out to you. Help me do that tonight at two judges from our circuit court, Judge Jill Cummings and Judge Kevin Hessler. Welcome back. We just had a quick break, a public service announcement, and now we're ready to get back to talking about being a circuit court judge and now facing a retention election that's coming up in the primary. One thing we didn't address in the first segment is explaining to our viewers that all of your names will be on both the Democratic primary ballot, a ballot and both, and on the Republican ballot. So if the seven judges uh, come out on top of one other 
person is running uh, that didn't make it through the selection process is uh, the game's over. You win. Well, if you get on both ballots. Y yes. So the well, the thing is, so, so we we're want on Republicans both as well as Democrats to be looking for the judges to vote for retention. Right. Since uh, judges, we are nonpartisan. That's why we will appear on both ballots. We'll appear on the Democratic primary ballot as well as the Republican primary ballot. There'll be eight names listed on the ballot. Seven of us are judges, uh, uh, currently appointed and sitting judges. So the top seven on the Democratic primary and the top seven from the Republican primary will go on to the general election in November. Top seven in results. Top seven in results. Because I think both. it's important for our, our viewers to know that looking at the ballot, you don't know who is already a judge. That's right. The names will just be listed in alphabetical order. Yeah. It, the, the title judge will not appear on the ballot before any of our names. There'll be no indication who an inc that the seven of us, which are technically incumbents, are that won't be indicated on the ballot. There'll just be eight names listed in alphabetical order, and seven of us are currently already judges on the circuit court. Who have successfully gone through the process we Who discussed have, earlier. Yes. That's quite a situation to be in, uh, because on every other office, it is indicated <coughs> incumbent, you know, who the incumbents are. And that used to be uh, most favorable. Now with the mood in many elections is to throw everybody out, <laughs> being an incumbent, I don't know if that helps you so much anymore. Well, we've had a lot of people indicate to us that they've uh, made the effort to learn who we are and learn about us. Uh, we've had the opportunity to appear at some forums mm -hmm. uh, to uh, have the people that attend those forums get to know us, and uh, that's been helpful. Uh, but it's still a challenge to have everybody remember all seven of our names. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to do our best at the polls to help people out if they're mm -hmm. uh, still uncertain. Uh, but we're uh, all about getting all of us, uh, the, the seven incumbent judges, through uh, both primaries. And uh, uh, that's our primary mission right now. Uh, in addition to doing our daytime jobs. Um, right, you're in the bench. <coughs> right. And working full time as right. judges. Yeah. Right. And there are various uh, opinions about whether it's a good thing or not to have judges stand for election. Uh, some people feel very strongly that it shouldn't be a politicized process. Right. Uh, but I think the uh, uh, concession that's made uh, in that regard is to make sure everybody knows we're nonpartisan and that's why we appear on both, both, both ballots. ballots. And, and we're under certain restrictions, too. It's not like legislative candidates for legislative office or executive office who can take positions on issues. Um, we're, not, we're ethically uh, not permitted to um, take positions on specific issues that may come before us. And, and you also <clears throat> have to be prepared for the heavy workload. You see, our viewers get the impression that you come in and you take the bench and sometimes it's not right at 9 o'clock when you scheduled something at 9 o'clock, but it's because other things are going on in your office. They come up from the assignment office that are walkthroughs that are emergency type things, and you have stacks of files in every judge's office with motions that need ruling on and things of that nature. So it's not like, okay, the courtroom's empty at 4 o'clock or they must all be gone. No. The lights are burning long after 4 o'clock, aren't they? There's always something going on behind the scenes. And what yeah. I will say is that judges, they make it look easy. As, a, as an attorney, when I would appear in court, mm. it looked easy. They take the bench. They're not on the bench. They must be gone. But uh, <laughs> now having the opportunity to see there, I can see what goes on. And there's, there's always something going on behind the scenes. There, there's uh, emergency motions that come through. <clears throat> There are, uh, you know, attorneys waiting on opinions, so we have to write opinions in, in our spare time. We have to write <laughs> orders in our spare time. So there's a, always, we're, we're researching the law, we're studying the law to make sure that we are uh, writing the opinions correctly and it's based on the correct law. We have to read and understand the law. Mm -hmm. So there's always something going on behind the scenes. It's never as simple as it looks. Either I'm on the bench or I'm home. That's, that's not the case. Right, right. No. Uh, 
retired Judge Michael Algio, who's back down in the state's attorney's office, and uh, a close friend, he had a stamp that was about six to eight inches wide and an inch and a half high that said denied. And he would half-heartedly, kidding, you'd say, send me all the criminal defense lawyers' motions. And he'd just joke with a pile of files and go, boom, boom, next one. He says, this doesn't take any time at all. <laughs> as a, you know, just as a former prosecutor and back as a prosecutor that he would deny them all, which fortunately wasn't for the case. It wasn't the case. Right. Definitely not. Judge Hessler, just before the break, we would talk and started to say that in January, you're going to be going to Sinna and Sins. That's Child in Need of Assistance and Child in Need of Services. Can you uh, tell our listeners a little bit about that? Because I've been involved in some of those cases, and they can go on and on until the kid turns 18. Right. <clears throat> well, it's an, an incredibly uh, demanding rotation for judges because you're coming in to a situation where uh, a child has been through a lot, uh, has been determined to be, as you said, in need of assistance for one reason or another. It could be as a result of child abuse. It could be because they were involved in criminal activity uh, and uh, their home situation is not great. Mm -hmm. So the, the services that are uh, made available to, uh, to, the, to the court to try to help those children get back on track uh, are tremendous. Uh, the lawyers that practice in that area are tremendous. It's a little bit smaller and more focused area than some others, but mm -hmm. uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, they're a great help to the judge, as are the people that provide services to these kids that really, really need it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, you know, if, they're, uh, if they've been through an experience that puts them in that court, uh, they're going to need to, t to have those kinds of services and continue to be involved because it's not generally the kind of problem that you can just say, okay, you've been in front of me once, uh, your, your situation is rectified, see you later. You're right, they stay with you uh, because the problems stay with them. Mm -hmm. And as an attorney, you keep having to go back every 30, 60 days for a review of the process. Which is a good thing. Yes, it is. They so stay, just... stay right on top of it. Right. Judge Cummins, having done <laughs> some of that work myself, one of the most difficult things for lawyers and for judges in the Sinna Sins area is some people lose their children after a while to foster care. And then if they're in foster care for now it's only a year, it used to be two years, it's eligible for the department, the, the health department, to ask that the parental rights be terminated, that they be declared by order of the court to no longer be the parent of that child. And defending situations like that were horrible. Um, and, you know, very rarely they were ones that you got paid for. Right. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in one that got paid for, and I had Judge uh, John McAuliffe. And this goes back so far, Lynn, Lynn Boynton was his clerk. And we, uh, he, he said, you just spoiled Labor Day weekend for me. He took it under advisement Friday afternoon, and he came back Tuesday morning, and he read his opinion, which took him about 30 minutes to read. It was, you know, like pages and pages and pages. And until the last sentence, I didn't know that I lost. And that absolutely crushed me. It did. It really. It really did. Um, because I felt those parents really should stay involved in that young lady's life. Have you had any experience like that yet in your legal career? Well, as a judge, it would come in in the family right. law arena. So, as uh, Judge Hessler said, family law cases make up the majority of the cases in the circuit court. So. Although I sit in the civil rotation, I have had a number of, I've had some of everything. I've had a number of, of mm -hmm. family law matters. And it is in those family law cases when we're talking about um, what's in the best interest of the children. They're, those are always very difficult situations mm -hmm. if you're um, regarding the custody of the child and who's going to have custody of the child. Those are incredibly 
difficult decisions all the way around. And sometimes I don't know that there's any winners technically in those cases, but we have to do what's in the best interest of the child in all those situations. They are emotionally charged cases usually. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have to take everything into consideration, uh, apply the factors, apply the law as we, as we know it and the factors in, in custody cases and then come out and render a, a decision that you know is going to be heartbreaking to mm -hmm. one side or the mm -hmm. other. Uh, but it's important that we do that with um, compassion and empathy and following the law and that's all we can do. Now, we know we are charged with a great responsibility there that we take very seriously. So just as Judge McAuliffe spent his uh, Labor Day weekend, mm -hmm. that's how we often spend our weekends, writing opinions and studying and, and going back and forth, reviewing the testimony, making sure that we are doing the right thing under the law, mm -hmm. particularly when it involves families and children. See, and it's exactly the reason what your, your answers in our discussion here really illuminates how dangerous it is to have the names on the ballot. That the system is, in my opinion, it's, it's, I'm editorializing, it, that anyone can run for that position. And by accident, they could, in their position on the ballot, they could get elected. And then they're in there to make a decision such as we just discussed and we've discussed with with Judge Hessler, it, it just it doesn't add up in my common sense thinking, especially with all you've been through to become appointed by the governor. Right. Well, I, I agree with you. It does take a, a certain amount of experience uh, and time in the courtroom uh, to be able to appreciate uh, the way things get done and the process that has to work in order for a judge to know what the judge needs to know in order to make a call as difficult as something like terminating the parental, the, the, the rights of a parent. Uh, generally that is a pretty, well, it's the most extreme remedy. You think about uh, family law cases where you're dealing with custody. Uh, in most in instances, you're just deciding how much time and under what conditions a child will spend with each parent. Uh, but in a termination case, uh, you're actually saying, I'm sorry, that child is no longer going to be your child. Mm -hmm. And in most, if not all instances, there's not going to be any more contact. But that's only after uh, the system has hopefully given that parent every opportunity uh, to straighten themselves Correct. out by, right. by saying, you know, here's your problem, here's what you need to do to address it. And it may be a very significant number of conditions, uh, but they're given a, an opportunity to straighten themselves out. And uh, as Judge Cummins says, ultimately in those situations, it's what's in the best interest of this child. And you, in order to decide that, you have to take a whole host of things into consideration. Very we serious and difficult <clears throat> job. We're yeah. already out of time. I want to thank you both for coming in to see us. Thank you. Wish you all the best and thank assume you. the best for you both on both ballots. Judge Kevin Hessler and Judge Jill Cummings. Thank you, Pat. Thank My you. pleasure. You're watching Inside Out. We are here on Channel 16, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evening at 730. Have a pleasant day.